We'll get started right off, um, and it is my pleasure to introduce the Vice Chairman for Supervision of the Federal Reserve, Randy Randall Quarrel. Sorry about that. <laughs> i got to get those formal terms right here. And I'm going to go over the real bio, but I just want to tell you the, the sort of the, the real scoop here, which is the first time, or first when Randy Quarles, Randall Quarles was nominated as Vice Chair for Supervision, many of us said, and who is he? And then at the at the time, Governor Jay Powell said, oh, he's a good guy. So we all said, well, he's obviously a good guy then, because we heard it for Governor Powell, so it must be true. I don't guess that's about right, you think? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. But we are thrilled to be able to have the Vice Chair for Supervision here today. It's no small ask for uh, a member of the Board of Governors to come to St. Louis to spend a day on the topic of community banking. But when you oftentimes read in the papers the issues associated with the larger banking organizations and you see the thought time being spent on that, you realize to take a day, a day and a half, to spend time with community bankers really makes it clear that community banking is equally as important to individuals at the Board of Governors and we really do appreciate that, so thank you for that. <clears throat> Vice Chairman Quarles was sworn in as Vice Chairman for Supervision on October 13th, 2017. Has it been a year almost? Wow. Prior to his appointment, he was founder and managing director of the Sinosia Group, an investment firm. He has served as Under Secretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance and as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs. He has also served as the policy chair of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. and as an executive director of the IMF. He received an A.B., and I am told it's A.B., not B.A., um, so I want to get that right, in philosophy and economics from Columbia University, and he earned his law degree from the Yale School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Governor Randall Quarles. Thank you. Thanks very much for that uh, warm introduction. And it's a delight to uh, be in St. Louis, a delight to be at this uh, conference. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, speak today. This is a unique uh, event, uh, coming to get, uh, bringing together every year bankers and bank supervisors and researchers uh, to discuss recent trends in community banking practices and policy issues that are on the mind of the conference attendees. Uh, so I wanted to start first uh, by conveying my own perspective on the importance of community banks. Community banks have a long history of providing essential financial services to households and small businesses and small farms and communities across the United States. And their ability to effectively provide these services speaks to the strength of the community banking business model. That is, establishing and maintaining local relationships and offering customers a face-to-face -face interaction with a local banker. And it's something that I've, I've observed firsthand, especially for community banks in rural communities. Growing up in rural Colorado and Utah, I saw the importance of community bankers having local knowledge and being personally invested in the communities they serve. That local knowledge and the relationship-based lending that's the hallmark of community banking can stem losses during downturns, as community banks may be able to work with borrowers to avoid losses, Indeed, research has shown that small business lending at small banks declined less severely than at large banks during the last recession. At the same time, I've seen the challenges that many, many community banks face. I want to be careful not to overstate those challenges. To paraphrase Mark Twain, the reports of your demise are greatly exaggerated. Uh, and I believe that the community banking model has many advantages and will continue to play an integral role in our financial system. So these sorts of dynamics are one reason that community banks are an important topic for research. As you probably know, this is the sixth annual community banking conference, co-sponsored by the Federal Reserve and the Conference of State Bank Supervisors. And it's the first conference for which the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is joining as a co-sponsor. The organizers of the inaugural conference decided that rather than holding a traditional academic style conference, that they'd invite bankers and bank supervisors to hear what the researchers had to say and to share their real world experience with the researchers. The hope was that these interactions would prove beneficial to all three groups, 
And the positive feedback that uh, we at the Fed have received from conference attendees over the past five years strongly supports the wisdom of the organizer's initial decision. Over time, the conference has evolved with some new features introduced each year. The case study competition, which is sponsored by the CSBS, introduces undergraduates to community banking and to some of the challenges that community bankers face. The Emerging Scholars Program was also added to the conference a few years ago. This prog program is intended to support PhD students who are considering or working on a dissertation on a banking-related topic and encourage them to develop a research agenda that focuses on community banking issues. I'd like to congratulate this year's winning case study team, Eastern Kentucky University, and emerging scholars Jiayi Xu, Kao Fang, and Flora Ma. Turning to the topic of today's speech, it occurs to me that we often speak of community banks as though they're all pretty much the same. But in reality, there's considerable heterogeneity within the group of firms that are commonly considered to be community banks. One important dimension of diversity is size, which can range anywhere from less than $100 million uh, to around $10 billion in assets. As noted by Chairman Powell, then Governor Powell, when he spoke at this conference two years ago, looking at community banks as a monolithic group masks some important differences between the smallest and largest community banking organizations. For example, essentially all of the decline in the number of community banking organizations over the past two decades has taken place among those with assets less than $100 million. And these smallest banking organizations have consistently had a lower average rate of return on assets than their larger peers. Another significant aspect of diversity among community banks is the type of market served, particularly urban versus rural. These two types of areas differ in many respects, including the age distribution of the population, the share of the population with a college degree, home ownership rates, poverty rates, uh, and the share of the population with internet access. And while the national population has been growing over the past 20 or 30 years, many rural areas have experienced population declines, and the share of the population living in rural areas has been falling. Furthermore, since 2008, most job growth in the United States has occurred in urban areas. So given these differing circumstances, it's not surprising that community banks operating in rural and urban areas tend to face different challenges. For example, the number of competitors faced by a banking organization tends to be larger in urban banking markets than in rural markets while hiring and retaining high-quality employees can be more difficult in rural areas. And some observers have expressed concern about the implications of bank consolidation over the past two or three decades for access to banking services in rural areas, while also wondering about the future viability of rural community banks. So the number of community banks has been declining over the last 20 years. But community banks still account for more than 95% of the total number of banks operating in the United States. The decline has been roughly similar for urban and rural community banks, leaving the share of community banks that operate primarily in rural markets quite stable at just over 50%. Just over half of all the community banks operate in rural markets versus urban markets. While urban community banks are quite a bit larger than their rural counterparts uh, on average, over the last 20 years, rural community banks have consistently earned higher rates of return on assets and rates of return on equity than their urban peers, despite a more challenging economic environment. Now, while the data present a compelling high-level picture, they don't tell the whole story. For example, averages across a large number of markets don't tell us what's going on in any individual market. In addition, much of the data that I'm talking about now that I'll be presenting today is aggregated to the county level, which obscures community level dynamics. Some communities within a county may have lost banks or bank branches, while others may have gained, and that would show up in our data as a steady number, a consistent uh, number of banks serving that, that market. In the, but in the rural Mountain West, where I grew up, a single county can be physically larger than some eastern states, uh, 
Uh, and therefore, that can mask some uh, important differences in availability, focusing on the county level data, but that's the data that we have. Uh, and the demographics of the communities, for example, high or low income uh, that have lost or gained are also not visible, but important. So the Fed staff is engaged in efforts to further our understanding of the effects of losses of banks or bank branches on the people who work and live in the affected communities, uh, even where the high level county, where the county level data shows uh, a sort of a steady presence. Now the number of banks in the United States fell by almost half over the past 20 years, from about 10,700 in 1997 to about 5,600 in 2017. About 97% of the de decrease was accounted for by community banks. Looking at the trend uh, in the number of urban and rural community banks, that's the figure that's up on the board here, we see that the number of banks in both of these categories has been falling over time. The rate of decline was steeper for rural banks than for urban banks before the financial crisis, but has reversed in the post-crisis period. This reversal may be due to the fact that, as we'll see in a moment, urban community banks suffered more severe losses in the immediate post-crisis period than did rural community banks. And the share of community banks that operate primarily in rural markets has increased slightly from 53% to 54%. In some circumstances, we'd call that steady, but uh, while there are more rural community banks than urban community banks, the latter, the urban banks, consistently account for a larger volume of deposits, loans, and offices than the former. This difference is, this difference is due in part to the average size of an urban community bank in terms of total assets being about two and a half to three and a half times that of the average rural community bank, as shown in the slide that's on the screen now. Uh, as community banks have increased in asset size, they've also grown their branch networks. The average number of branches for an urban bank is about 1.7 to 2 times that of a rural bank uh, in figure three. Looking next at the total amount of deposits held by all urban community banks and all rural community banks, we can see that both have been trending upward over time. Growth in total loans outstanding was strong for both urban and rural community banks between 1997 and 2008. That's the slide that's on the screen now. Declines in lending in the immediate post-crisis period between 2008 and 2011 were more severe for urban banks than for rural ones. Coming out of the recent recessions, uh, rural community banks have seen quite modest loan growth since 2011, while the pace of growth in urban community bank lending has been stronger since 2013 starting from that uh, lower base of having had more losses. This divergence in recent growth rates may be due to the fact that the recovery from the recent recession has been much more robust in urban areas than in rural areas of the country. When it comes to performance measures, rural community banks consistently outperform urban community banks with regard to return on assets, that's the figure here, with regard to return on equity, that's this slide, uh, and this difference was particularly pronounced during the financial crisis, when profitability fell much more sharply at urban community banks than at rural banks. Looking at charge-off rates, figure eight, we see that they've been quite similar for the two types of community banks over most of the past 20 years, except for the period, the five years after the crisis, 2008 to 2013, when rural banks had lower charge-off rates than urban banks. This data suggests that despite facing a more challenging economic environment, rural community banks appear to be holding their own relative to urban community banks. Now I'd like to shift the focus a bit from the banking industry and the banks themselves to the communities they serve by exploring whether access to banking services, whether provided by community banks or larger banks, has been declining in urban or rural areas of the country. As of 2017, the average urban market was home to 18 community banks and just over eight large banks, which represents a change from 21 community banks and six large banks in 1997. The average number of community banks per rural market 
has been remarkably stable over the past 20 years, that's per rural market, at right around four, while the average number of large banks per rural market has increased from just under one to 1.4. I don't think there's any particular market that has 0.4 of a bank, but uh, <laughs> these statistics indicate that, uh, perhaps surprisingly, the average number of banks in rural markets has actually increased in the past 20 years. Uh, if we look at the number of bank branches, rather than just the number of competitors, we see a significant increase in the number of branches in the average urban market, with the entire increase coming from branches of large banks. Over the same period, there was essentially no change in the number of branches in rural markets, with a slight shift upward in the share of branches that are accounted for by large banks. And again, there is substantial variation in the experiences of individual markets as some local and urban markets gained and others lost bank branches. As the share of branches in the average banking market operated by community banks has declined, so too has the share of deposits held at community banks. This shift in deposit shares away from community banks, similar to the shift in branch shares, has been substantial in urban markets, but only marginal in rural markets. Community banks held almost half of all deposits at urban bank branches in 1997, but only over a, just over a third in 2017. In rural markets, community banks collectively had a deposit market share of 80% in 1997, declining quite moderately to 77% in 2017. Despite the decline in the overall share of deposits held by community banks in urban and rural markets over the past 20 years, the average individual community bank operating in each type of market, urban and rural, has seen almost no change in its deposit market share. That's this figure here. In other words, the decline in the share of market deposits held in aggregate by community banks is due to a smaller number of community banks. The fact that the average individual community bank has maintained or increased its deposit market share since 2008 suggests that community banks have been able to compete quite successfully with larger banks in both urban and rural markets during and since the recent recession. As I've mentioned, the average numbers of banks and bank branches have increased or remained constant in rural markets in recent years, despite a wave of mergers that has greatly reduced the number of U.S. banking organizations. Industry consolidation has led to fewer banks, but maintained most of the branches of the acquired banks. In addition, most mergers and acquisitions have involved expansion into new markets by the acquiring bank rather than acquisitions of local competitors, which has allowed local communities to continue to enjoy a variety of potential providers of banking services despite the consolidation in the industry. But one unavoidable aspect of consolidation is a loss in the number of bank headquarters offices. The number of bank headquarters located in urban markets has fallen by half over the past 20 years, while the number in rural markets has fallen by 45%. Consolidation has led to a doubling in the number of banking markets, almost all of which are rural, in which no banks are headquartered. We hear anecdotally that banks are more attuned to the needs of the communities in which they are headquartered, so the significance of this loss could have an effect on the local markets. Uh, and, and there I want to continue now with some of this uh, 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 more, I don't know if it's qualitative uh, evidence, um, because data and averages often don't tell the whole story, as I indicated at the outset of these remarks. At the end of the day, we care about bank branch locations because we care about the people in the communities that they're serving, or in some cases not serving, adequately. So even if the data tell us that most rural markets are well served, we need to focus our attention on those markets that may not be as well served, and how that's affecting the people who bank or cannot bank there. Uh, and that's why the Federal Reserve System's community development function has undertaken a national series of listening sessions to assess the real effects of bank closures on rural communities. Reserve Bank staff are conducting the sessions around the country to gather information from consumers and small business owners in rural communities that have been directly affected by bank closures. 
To identify where to conduct those sessions, we use data to identify rural towns that have experienced bank branch closures. In some cases, these towns lost the only bank in town and now have no remaining banks. Then we convened local residents and small business owners to ask them about what the loss of a bank meant to them and their community. For some residents, the closure has not been much of a problem. Most, if not all, of the listening session participants in Clark, South Dakota, noted that they do most of their routine banking online. Some in Clark even noted that they didn't think that ATMs were necessary, as most of the retail businesses in town offer cash back with debit card purchases. Nonetheless, residents of Clark spoke positively about the importance of the personal touch a local bank can provide. Residents liked familiar faces at the teller window, loan officers who understood the local economy when making small business lending decisions. But online banking is not necessarily an opportunity for everyone. Indeed, even for community banks themselves, technology may be perceived as a threat or an, an, oppor or an opportunity, depending, for example, on whether the necessary infrastructure is available in a particular market. In Nicholas County, Kentucky, which is located in Appalachia, many residents don't have access to high-speed internet. This lack of access has led most residents to travel outside of the uh, uh, county to conduct their banking needs. That situation is not optimal for anyone, but it presents a particular challenge for the elderly, people without a car, busy small business owners who don't have time to travel 25 miles each way to make change, to deposit checks. Uh, in Center County, Pennsylvania, we heard that the transportation challenge is particularly acute for the Amish. Even 10 miles is a long way to travel by horse and buggy. The loss of a bank branch also has a ripple effect on a community as a whole. In the village of Brushton, New York, which lost its only bank branch in 2014, small business owners commented that when residents must leave the village to access banking services, they're more likely to shop, eat, and pay for other services in other towns, which creates additional hardship for the small businesses of Brushton. Additionally, as the ability of community members to get access to cash has decreased, credit card use has increased. Small business owners in Brushton say that this growth in credit card usage has significantly affected the cost of doing business. Lastly, one theme that we heard loud and clear across the country was that the loss of a local bank meant the loss of an important civic institution. Banks don't just cash checks and make loans. They place ads in small town newspapers. They donate to local nonprofits. They sponsor local Little League teams. I played on a little league team in Los Animas, Colorado when I was six years old that was sponsored by our local bank that is no longer there. Uh, as towns lose banks and bankers, they also lose important local leaders. We'll continue to conduct these listening sessions across the country throughout the fall. In fact, one of these listening sessions will take place next week, just two hours down the road. Uh, two hours seems like a long time to me, but it's just two hours down the road in... <laughs> In, in Reynolds County, Missouri. We look forward to sharing the collective results of our efforts in a report that should be published in early 2019. To sum up, the numbers of urban and rural community banks have been declining over the past 20 years, but com community banks continue to play an important role in both types of markets. Urban and rural community banks face different challenges, but on average, both of them, as, as a category, seem to be faring well in the post-crisis period, and the average rural banking market has not seen any decline in the number of banks or bank branches over recent years. For the local areas where the availability of banking services has declined, we are in the process of assessing the effects of this decline on the people who live and work in those communities. And I look forward to continuing to engage in this area and monitor the developments in this most vital part of the banking ecosystem. Thank you very much, and I'm hoping that we have time for some questions. Mm -hmm.